Hello and welcome everyone. Today we'll be discussing an important topic that is most misdiagnosed in critical care that is metabolic encephalopathy. So brain depends on a stable internal environment. If the body's metabolism is disrupted because of any kind of a severe illness, the function can get affected. In ICU settings, the brain dysfunction often occurs after major organ failure like liver, kidney, lungs with multi-organ failure also affecting the brain. A patient with severe kidney disease that is having uremia may become confused or drowsy due to toxin buildup affecting the brain. So it's a two-way relationship. The brain doesn't fail in isolation. The organ failures often impact it and vice versa also. That is, the stroke of the brain can affect the other organs. Acute brain failure can lead to a sympathetic storm stressing the heart, lung and the gut. The example here is a case of a traumatic brain injury causing unstable blood pressure and heart rates. Similarly, heart and liver failure can impair the brain metabolism leading to what is called as metabolic encephalopathy. So what is this metabolic encephalopathy? It refers to the brain dysfunction due to the biochemical imbalances, not direct trauma or bleeding in the brain. However, even in these cases, actual structural damage may be seen. So you can find MRI changes like uh, white matter swelling in uremia, diffuse brain swelling in fulminant hepatic failure. We'll go into more details of these MRI findings. The worst part about all this is that the recovery is never really complete. Even if the failing organs they start improving and the labs start normalizing, the brain may never return to its previous state. So permanent damage can occur depending on how long and how severe this dysfunction was. So turn back again, what is this metabolic encephalopathy? It is Commonly a catch-all diagnosis that we use in our ICUs for altered consciousness, confusion and agitation where in whom we do not find any structural lesion like a stroke or a bleed. Now this refers to brain dysfunction caused by problems in the metabolism often from some failing organ. So how does this happen? The brain cells need a steady supply of oxygen and glucose and they need a very stable environment around the neurons. So they need an intact biochemical process. When this is disrupted, the brain function suffers, which includes the lack of oxygen and nutrients, the inference from the energy production, the problems in transporting the metabolites into the neuron, inhibition of the mitochondrial energy pathways. So common clinical uh, labels that we use are encephalopathy is named after undergoing underlying organ dysfunction. For example, uremic encephalopathy is used for kidney failure, hepatic for liver failure, post anoxic for post cardiac arrest, pancreatic or pulmonary. These are less common causes of encephalopathy, but they can be seen. Uh, regarding delirium versus encephalopathy, how do we really differentiate? Encephalopathy is a more general term of brain dysfunction, which can include various conditions. While del delirium is a subset, it is a type of encephalopathy where you find agitation, restlessness and hallucinations. Though the patient can be having hypoactive delirium as well, where you can find the patients drowsy and confused. So in ICU patient, a patient taking out a client's talking to imaginary people is a very common scenario. The alternative term that can be used is acute brain failure. Some experts suggest calling this condition acute brain failure, like we say acute kidney failure and heart failure. Now this improves clarity and emphasizes an urgency. Now the problems with the current terminology is that we have added too many adjectives like toxic, metabolic, multifactorial, which can be confusing even for a medical person and definitely much more confusing for a layman who is getting his uh, relatives treated in the ICU. These broad terms may reduce the diagnostic clarity and discourage further investigations because we have basically not 
told what toxic is causing this encephalopathy what metabolic derangement is causing the encephalopathy or which factor of the multifactorial thing so it actually makes the life of everyone very difficult now toxins and drugs as a separate category two toxic encephalopathy should be used for neurotoxins for environmental and occupational poisoning some drug related brain toxicity these are usually non metabolic and irreversible and often lack specific diagnostic tests so factors confound the diagnosis of metabolic encephalopathy now these are the things which are going on in the icu which uh, may not be disease per se but they will make our life more difficult because they make our diagnosis difficult because they can be confounding factors and itself can be cause of the drowsiness the most common is the use of sedation icu patients often receive multiple drugs polypharmacy especially the sedatives they can have accumulating effect especially if given in infusions uh, with a background of liver or renal failure causing delayed awakening now fentanyl clearance can be 10 times more slower in organ failure older patients are more susceptible because of changes in the body composition because they have less water less albumin and has then uh, less clearance so the key point here is that if a patient remains unresponsive consider whether sedative drugs are still active whether you can give reversal agents what has been the duration of the infusions how long we expect this clearance to occur before we can attribute it to a metabolic encephalopathy uh, regarding shock and low blood pressure they can in self cause coma and confusion if especially if the map is remaining low brain is extremely sensitive in the watershed areas other organs need higher map but still brain is a uh, important factor always ensure adequate perfusion before labeling a patient is encephalopathy regarding the electrolyte imbalance the common electrolyte that affects the brain would be the sodium so hyponatremia can be a very important factor especially if the sodium is less than 125 and definitely if it is less than 115 a rapid drop causes brain swelling and if it rapidly corrected it can result in central pontine myelinosis at risk patients are alcoholics malnourished and the elderly so the clinical signs of cpm are flaccid paralysis dysarthria bulbar palsy and oculomotor problems safe correction is around less than 6 in 6 hours regarding the other electrolytes it is hyponatremia this can be affecting the consciousness if it is more than 160 and the osmolality has gone beyond 350 the osmolality correlates better with the mental status than sodium alone the next is hypocalcemia that is low calcium the signs of personality changes depression confusion uh, the laryngospasm and the various signs that we have been reading the bostek sign is the tapping the face will cause the twitching of all the facial muscles and trozio sign is if you inflate the blood pressure cuff it will cause a carpal spasm in severe cases you will have muscle cramps spasms and breathing issues Uh, the next is antibiotic induced neurotoxicity the two commonest antibiotics are metronidazole and cefepime in metronidazole long term use that is 7 to 30 days confusion cerebellar problem seizures in mri you will find uh, symmetrical dentate nucleate involvement uh, cefepime it crosses the blood brain barrier especially during sepsis it causes confusion myoclonus and non convulsive status eeg will show epileptic patterns and more common in renal failure and overdosing even standard doses can be toxic so the best practice would be to stop the cefepime and switch to a, another antibiotic chemotherapy can co- also cause neurotoxicity the common agents are cisplatin methotrexate vincristine etoposide and immune checkpoint inhibitors as well as car t therapy symptoms is altered sensorium fever headache speech difficulty in mri you will find white matter edema t2 flare hyperintensities often mimicking paraneoplastic encephalopathy the treatment is steroids ivig plasma exchange and rituximab most patient recover in 3 to 8 weeks but 10% will need long term care uh, the mri patterns that we need to remember are basal ganglia where you will find wernicke's or uremia or severe hyperglycemia in dentate nuclei as we have told in metronidazole cortical gray matter extreme hypoglycemia hyperammonemia periventricular white matter in chemotherapy corticospinal tract b2 deficiency corpus callosum in antiepileptics asymmetrical white matter in tnf alpha blockers 
peritooccipital edema in press and uh, central pons if it is osmotic demyelination so uh, these are some of the mri findings which you can find in uh, the metabolic encephalopathies regarding organ failure and their effects on the brain the first would be the lung failure uh, we have seen in COVID-19, low oxygen and high CO2 did alter consciousness, hypoxemia can cause syncope, coma and neuro uh, neuronal injury. Brain injury occurs PO2 is less than 30. Damage usually affects deep white matter like corpus pallidus, globus pallidus. Hypercapnemia causes vasodilatation, slow brain activity and it can cause the drowsiness. Uh, the use of sedation and ventilation will affect the brain. So the clinical clue is don't wait for dyspnea even without it the brain may be suffering in lung failure. Uh, regarding the other factors the most common one that is the kidney where the uremic encephalopathy is seen and other toxins like guanidine glutamate accumulate in uremic causing confusion, drowsiness and agitation. There is a classical triad, uh, asterisks visible in hands, tongue and face. MRI will show features of press even basal ganglia changes. BP usually high which can create a brain edema dialysis helps but the recovery is slow and not based on creatinine alone old term that is dialysis disequilibrium which causes rapid shifts in urea lead to brain swelling uh, liver failure ammonia is the male culprit if it is more than 75 millimoles per liter leads to astrocyte swelling brain edema increased intracranial pressure in mri you will find edema of the basal ganglia and the cortex Rare metabolic causes are ornithin transcarbamylase deficiency. It's a genetic disorder of the uric acid cycle. Uh, the urea cycle, sorry. The treatment is hemofiltration to clear the ammonia, sodium benzoate, arginine, citrulline, carnitine, cerebral edema may be managed aggressively in transplant candidates. Pancreatic, it is a hyperosmolar state. Glucose going more than 800 can cause stupor and coma. Osmolarity correlates better than glucose. Focal deficits are seen. Aphasia, hemiparesis and may be seen. Uh, but reversal after glucose co correction can be done. Uh, children with DK are at high risk of fatal cerebral edema with a very high mortality rate. Thyroid failure, that is Hashimoto's disease, rare uh, autoimmune condition. The symptoms are coma, memory loss, slow reflexes, puffiness. MRI will show white matter lesions, high TPO, abnormal uh, antibodies, normal to high TSH. And uh, the next is heart failure, the post cardiac arrest after CPR, the global injury can cause the uh, brain dysfunction. It affects the thalamus, striatum, cortex and cerebellum. Pro prognostic signs are early brain swelling, no SS, EP response burst suppression, high uh, neuron specific NLAs. Myoclonus and seizures are common but treating them doesn't change outcomes. Prognosis is unclear without good imaging and EEG. Uh, finally, you have sepsis and multi-organ failure. It causes a very complex type of injury and it's mostly from the inflammatory cytokines, poor cerebral autoregulation, hypotension. Autopsy has shown that neuronal loss in wakeful centers like uh, locus ceruleus. Uh, MRI will show non-specific white matter changes, sometimes it can even be normal. High fever can worsen the brain dysfunction by increasing the metabolic requirement causing delirium and apathy. So this is a diagrammatic representation showing the various type of brain damages seen in various organ failures. Regarding metabolic toxic intermediates and cofactor deficiency, these must also be kept in mind. So when do we suspect these rare cases? You will suspect them when. Uh, the history is unusual that it there is some unexplained coma in a young patient like that uh, the clinical course is odd worsens despite every supportive measure the mri shows unusual findings these uh, things are the acute intermittent porphyria inherited enzyme deficiency the heme synthesis uh, triggers by stress menstruation fasting surgery and drugs symptoms are abdominal pain confusion hallucination seizures the mechanism is toxic heme precursors like the ala cross the blood brain barrier interact with the gaba receptors and damage the neurons mri will mimic press reversible changes in occipital and parietal cortex it can cause central pontine myelinonysis due to associated hyponatremia Treatment is hematin IV, 2 to 5 mg per kg per day for up to 14 days. The next is hyperammonemia. This is non-hepatic, uh, can seen in post-lung transplant, maybe due to urea cycle defects, urea plasma uh, infection. Uh, presence with stupor and seizures, uh, important clue is elevated ammonia without a clear liver disease. Uh, pellagra, niacin deficiency, classic is alcoholic, malnourished, homeless people. The clinical triad is diarrhea dermatitis and dementia 
empirical therapy is oral nicotinamide 100 milligram EDS while awaiting lab results. The next is thiamine deficiency that is vitamin B1 deficiency occurs three weeks without thiamine in diet risk increases if IV glucose is given without supplementing B1. The classical triad is one nick Korsakov triad that is confusion, ataxia and ophthalmoplegia. MRI will show lesions in the mammillary bodies, medial thalami and the periaqueductal gray. The treatment is thiamine. 100 mg IV with magnesium containing the multivitamins. The prognosis if severe full recovery is unlikely, persistent cognitive and ambulatory issues will remain. Uh, finally, we have MELAS. This is a mitochondrial disorder. In this, uh, the key signs would be seizures, recurrent stroke, short stasher, developmental delay. MRI will show cortical involvement, basal ganglia calcification, sparing of the white matter. Diagnosis is mitochondrial DNA test where you will find a mutation, the muscle biopsy will show ragged red fibers, elevated CSF lactate which is associated with both prognosis. Treatment is coenzyme Q10 2 mg per kg per day for 6 months. So the diagnostic approach with metabolic encephalopathy is you document your neurological findings, go for your basic lab test, the various organs that we have seen affecting, don't forget the thyroid and the pancreas. Do your ABG, check your ammonia and lactate, do a imaging, do a 24 hour uh, EEG monitoring, CSF analysis and finally genetic testing. So out doing everything you will finally find definitely some reason for the metabolic encephalopathy. So the uh, take home message is metabolic encephalopathy is not a diagnosis in itself. So please try to find some cause for this. Always correlate with organ dysfunction, imaging and EEG. MRI abnormality with possible structural injury can be seen but then it can be normal as well so don't ignore the MRI findings. Recovery often happens when the organ function improves but then it may not be complete. So post discharge, follow up, rehabilitation, care is a critical aspect that must be kept in mind. If there is no improvement think again reassess for rare causes like AIP, MELAS and various vitamin deficiencies. Thank you for your patience.